So our next presenter is a really good friend of ours and a regular attendee at our Windy City RAI monthly meetup. And he has a very powerful story uh, about resilience and overcoming obstacles that we're very excited for him to share with you all today. Everybody give it up a warm welcome for our friend, Mike Morawski from My Core Intentions. Map now. There we go. Figures I'd go after that panel. Um, so uh, everybody here knows about visualization, right? How important pictures are when we set goals and we we start to believe that we're going to be able to accomplish something, maybe build a syndication, raise equity, whatever we're going to do. Pictures are really important, right? So I'm going to ask everybody in the room, put everything down, sit back and close your eyes. If you're comfortable, close your eyes. I'm going to paint a picture over the next few minutes. Uh, and I'll tell you when to open your eyes again, but I'll paint a picture over the next few minutes that I want you to really uh, grasp hold of. So if you'd close your eyes and just sit back. So here's what I'd like you to picture that it's a beautiful spring morning. And you might be sitting on the back of, uh, on the back deck of your home. Sun's just coming up. You're drinking your coffee or maybe your soda, whatever you drink in the morning. And the dew's on the grass. You can hear the uh, birds chirping. The sun's kind of starting to feel bright. And you're just kind of sitting there, maybe you're your morning meditation or you're spending time in prayer whatever you normally do in the morning is one of your disciplines all of a sudden you start to hear some ruckus next door you wonder wow what's that it's starting to get a little bit louder maybe even starts to get to a point where it's a little bit chaotic so you get up and you stick your head around the corner and you take a look at what's going on and you see six or seven black SUVs pull up in front of your neighbor's house. All of a sudden, there's a number of men and women running around that have black flak jackets on that say FBI, DEA, ATF on the back of them. So now I want to ask you, what's the first thought going through your mind? You stand there a little bit more, the commotion gets a little bit more ruckusy. All of a sudden they shuffle your neighbor out in handcuffs, walk him down the driveway and put him in the back of an SUV. And it takes off down the street. So I wanna ask you, what's the first thought that's going through your mind? Are you prejudging? Next you see his wife and kids standing in the garage in tears. Now, what are you thinking? Man, I knew he was up to no good. It couldn't have been all that good. Maybe you have some compassion in your heart and you're even thinking, what's his wife and kids gonna do now? All of a sudden, everybody goes away. The show's over. You go back to drinking your coffee. Go ahead, you can open your eyes. And we'll come back to that in a minute. You know, I've been in real estate 30 years. Um, over that time, I've seen a lot of uh, great things. I've seen some tough things. I heard Jim Rowan say years ago that success leaves clues. And you know, that always stuck with me. That was one of those things that just made a lot of sense. And uh, it, Jim said at the time that if you follow successful people and do what they've done, you can cut your learning curve. He also said that if you uh, follow successful people who've made mistakes, you can keep yourself from making mistakes. Well, I started out, I was in the general contracting business and you know everybody here is an entrepreneur, right? And we all know as an entrepreneur, you wake up, you uh, you handle the sales, you handle the marketing, the hiring, the firing, the bookkeeping. And I happen to still be in the field pounding nails at that point. 
Woke up one morning, vividly remember sitting up in bed saying, I'm done, I can't do this anymore. I was burnt out. Decided to sell my company. I was fortunate enough, I had somebody that was uh, knocking on my door trying to buy my company. I did sell it and I decided to go into real estate. Well, I hadn't made that decision just then. Uh, my wife and I at the time, we house hacked a couple of houses. And now this was long before it was sexy, right? People do it now, it's natural. Back then, it was unheard of. But during that time, I met a real estate agent who was extremely successful. And I went to him and I said, hey, Todd, I'm thinking about going in the real estate business. And he encouraged me to do that. He said, Mike, I think you'd be really good at it. So uh, I, I followed up with that and said, could I shadow your team? And he said, no, uh, I'm gonna do one better than that. And I'm gonna date myself here, but he said, I'm gonna make you a cassette tape. And I say that because I don't think we could find anything to make a cassette tape on today. So he made me this cassette tape and I listened to it over and over and over again. That's what we have all these podcasts for today, right? You can listen to these podcasts and listen to them over and over, back it up, get good points, get good success that people have had. I went in the real estate business my first nine months as a sales agent. I sold 78 single family houses, didn't know anybody, all for sale by owners. I went, uh, after that, I built a team. We sold 125 listings a year. 2005 came around. I saw the market was starting to soften and slow down. I knew I was going to have to do something different. You know, I'm the guy, I hate to give anybody bad news. And so I didn't want to lay anybody off. I didn't want to tell them that business had slowed down. I had seven people working for me at the time. Uh, decided to go in the apartment business. Now, what I'll tell you is I didn't just wake up and say, hey, I'm going in the apartment business. What I did was when I was in the construction business, I did a lot of work for some uh, two syndicators here in Chicago that were pretty big. Uh, anybody heard of Inland Real Estate? Inland, uh, four high school teachers started uh, their company. They pulled some money together. They bought their first, first four unit apartment building right here on the Northwest side of Chicago. Today, they are the largest uh, or one of the largest REITs in the world, a real estate investment trust. Uh, they're in 80 countries around the world and they are in every asset class you can imagine. So I want you to think about the possibilities. What's possible for yourself? What do you think you might be able to attain in your own syndication business, your own real estate investing business, whether you want to stay small or whether you want to grow big? So I decided to go in the apartment business. 2005, I syndicated my first deal. It was a small 11-unit apartment building, and I knew nothing about it. I thought I, had all, I thought I knew it all. I was in real estate already for about 15 years. I came from that and went in the apartment business. It was a totally different world. I had no idea what NOI or cap rate was. I had to ask questions and learn and, and talk to people. But I learned because I took action. And that's what I want you to know is you take action and the more action you take, the more you're gonna learn. Education is really important. We all need to educate ourselves. I even continue to educate myself today uh, if, you know, because I learn things from people who have been on stage here and the passive investing panels and you know, Brian this morning, people who have spoken here today to give us information. So I, uh, I go in the apartment business, syndicate my first deal in 2005. And in 30 months, I raise $18 million by $60 million worth of real estate. It was 4,000 apartments in five US markets. During that same time, I built a property management company managing 7,500 doors. Built a company pretty close to $100 million in value. Fast forward a little bit, 2008 comes around, I'm sitting at lunch with my CFO and we're watching the news and they're carrying boxes out of Lehman Brothers by the droves. Anybody remember 2008? I looked across the table and I said, we're screwed, aren't we? He said, yeah, we're in big trouble. And at that point, I, I had no idea what the magnitude of that conversation was. By 2010, my company had become very unstable. Remember I said I grew, I, I bought $60 million worth of real estate in 30 months, very unstable. I tell, I tell people today, this is a marathon, not a sprint, take your time. It'll happen for you, just take your time, especially in the environment and the market that we're going into right now. 
I was very unstable as a company. I could not uh, uh, make all my investors happy. I had 38 companies, probably had 12 I should have let to go, go to foreclosure. And some investors get hurt, but remember I'm the guy that doesn't like to give bad news. So I didn't wanna tell my investors what was happening, even if it was market driven. So I say, okay, I think I can save this thing. Um, so I decide I'm going to start moving money between companies. I start taking money from uh, good, profitable syndications I had and moving that capital to uh, properties that weren't running as well. And it worked for a while. My accountant, my attorney both said, it's okay to do that. Go ahead. Just leave a paper trail. When, uh, when the markets come back, you put the money back. Now, here was my thought. I had been through a couple of recessions already. A recession lasts 17 or 18 months. There's a 10 or 12% correction in the marketplace. Not this time. Seven or eight years, 40% correction in the marketplace. People are still hurt by it today. Um, when we are in uh, the syndication business, when we are raising other people's capital, if you give me a dollar, I am held at a much higher standard. And I want you to remember that you are held at a much higher standard. So I thought I was doing the best thing I could for my investors. I wanted to save the company. What wound up happening was I didn't tell my investors what I was doing. So for non-disclosure, I got charged on wire fraud and mail fraud charges and sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. In 2013, I went to prison. I thought my life was over. Hey, you know, I was the neighborhood baseball coach. I didn't have a big house. I didn't have a fancy car. I didn't buy a boat. I didn't fly private. I was home every night for dinner. I got ripped from that to live in a 12 by 12 room with three men I didn't know, nor did I like. Wondering what the hell happened in my life. I was in prison about three weeks and then my wife decided she was gonna divorce me. And it crushed me. I walked around every day wondering how am I gonna get through today, much less 10 years of this. You know, the joke in prison was that we should take his shoelaces because we're afraid he's going to hurt himself. It wasn't a joke. Um, fast forward a couple more weeks and I'm in prison about six weeks and I walk in the gym one day. Now I'd gone from running marathons to being 35 pounds overweight and I absolutely hated myself. I walk in the gym one day and this guy walks up to me and I'll never forget it. Look me right in the face. He's probably 25 years younger than me. And he said, don't let these people beat you. All they want to do is take from you everything you've ever known. They can take your company. They can take your money. They can take your apartments. They can take that company that you built. And they can destroy your family. But what they can't take is who you are and what you're made of. You see, we all have something inside of us, right? We all have some reason that you're here today and that you're building a business. And I don't know what it was, but I think we all have these defining moments in our life and maybe more than one in our lives. And it's really important that we pay attention to those defining moments. It's that little inner voice that we get. I don't know what it was, but it was like a, somebody flipped a switch. And uh, I said, okay. He said, come to my class, start working out every day. You'll start to feel better. You'll start losing weight. I didn't want to believe it. Um, but I said, okay. And I started going to his class. I started to lose weight. I started to work out. I started to feel better. I wound up going to college. Uh, four years, I got a bachelor's degree in theology. I wrote two books. One is called Exit Plan. It's on the back table out there. Your Complete Guide to Multifamily Investing and Why You Need an Exit Plan Before You Buy. I've been to a lot of seminars. Everybody teaches us how to find a deal, get in a deal, operate a deal, but nobody ever taught me how to, buy, how to get out. Nobody ever taught me how to maximize my profit. And that's what I want people to understand is that you got to maximize your profit. I wrote a book on property management. I wrote two home study courses. I wrote an ethics course. So in prison, I taught real estate investing, property management, and ethics for six years. How ironic, a federal inmate teaching ethics, right, in prison. I was on an outreach program. I was a model prisoner and went into the community. And 40 times I told my story to local uh, business owners and college students, uh, trying to make a difference in people's lives. 
You know, we so easily can get hung up in uh, day-to-day activities. We forget about what's important in our life. We forget about what really matters. And that's what happened. Pride, greed, ego set in. I thought I could fix it all, and I didn't, and I couldn't. I, uh, in this outreach program, I was fortunate enough to meet a professor from the University of Minnesota, and he and I co-authored a paper together that we had published last year in the Business Journal of Ethics. I've uh, been home now a couple of years, a little more, about two and a half years now. And I'm in the coaching and training business. So I teach people how to invest in multifamily, how to build their business, not make the mistakes I made, and live a balanced quality lifestyle. I also got approved by the SEC to go back and sponsor deals, to be an issuer of securities again. So we just bought our first 40-unit apartment complex. A couple of my partners are here. They've been running around a little bit. Um, Thanks. You know what, so this is about not letting your past define you. You know, I feel more and more people are locked up in a prison. I was behind a wall, but you know what? People are locked up in their mind, in a prison in their mind. They let fear hold them back. They let insecurities hold them back. They let things hold them back that really don't matter. You know, you may have, you may come from from past abuse in your life. You may come from situations where uh, there was violence in your life. You may come from situations where you were held down, maybe alcohol, drugs, gambling, sex, whatever it may be, that may keep you back. That may keep you in a prison in your mind. Let that shit go. It doesn't matter. You got to move on. We all have to move on. And I think the biggest thing I learned was that I had the ability to move on. And uh, what's important and why I tell my story today is I tell my story because I want people to understand if I touch one person in a room and one person comes up to me afterwards and says, man, you made a difference in my life. You know, I told my story one day and a CEO from a major company walked up to me, walked and, and he said, you know, I was going down this road. I was going down this path and you've made me go the other way because I know if I would have gone this way, that I would have wound up in prison. But now this way, I think I can straighten things out. So I want people to understand it's very easy to make a mistake. It's very easy to get in trouble. You know, one thing that's really important to me today in my life that uh, I just, um, uh, while I was in prison, one of the things that we did, and you know, this is about resilience, right? This is about not letting your past define you. But when I was in prison, I was a founder and there were about eight of us, we started a Alcoholics Anonymous group. And yesterday I had nine years of sobriety. So like I said, you move on. You know, you can't let your past define you. you you've got a future, we all have a future. And if we are defined by what's happened in the past or what we've done before, we won't progress at all. So I want each and every person in this room just to understand that it's okay wherever you're at. Just make a decision to move forward and take action, take the next right step. Thanks. Mm -hmm.